Oh, there. Okay, so uh, welcome to IBC Media 2.0 Continuum's fourth workshop uh, from IBC Media. Just so you know, IBC 2.0 is the second edition of a massive five-year agenda enabling the greatest and largest blockchain ecosystem initiative in India. Today we are going to have an interesting session on Inc, which is a revolutionary tool by Parity Technologies, which can be used to write smart contracts in Rust for blockchains. Today we will be diving into uh, smart contract developments in Rust uh, after motivating the usage of Rust for smart contracts in the Substrate ecosystem. We'll take a look at some of the examples of Inc smart contracts. Uh, Parity's Inc playground will allow for interacting participation in the workshop and the participants will be able to code their own smart contracts by the end of this workshop. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Ashim Schneider with us today. Um, he's a smart contract tooling developer at Parity Technologies. Uh, he has immense experience in software architecture with a strong background in mathematics and programming. Uh, Ashim went to Leibniz University in Hanover and the University of Queensland. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Over to you now, Ashim. Okay. Hello, every, everyone. Um... I'm Achim Schneider from Parity Technologies, and uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Um, so I hope everyone can see my screen now, and I will start um, with my presentation and introducing myself again. So as I said, I'm Achim Schneider. I'm a smart contract tooling developer at Parity Technologies. I have a background in mathematics as well as programming and I'm like um, experienced in programming with front and tooling uh, like TypeScript React and also Rust. Um, you can reach me, you can find me on GitHub or on Element. Um, okay, um, I want to talk today about um, two things uh, Parity Technologies usually works with and uh, how we combine them. So uh, usually with Parity, if you build uh, on Parity with Substrate, you build in Rust and usually you use WebAssembly. You usually compile your Rust to WebAssembly to execute it. And um, like if you're not completely new to the ecosystem, you have probably heard about Substrate palettes um, so Substrate is a modular framework to build blockchains and you can compose different palettes, different building blocks to build your own um, Substrate based blockchain in Rust. And so there are, uh, you have a big variety of pre-built palettes uh, which Parity technology provides from which you can build your own blockchain. Uh, so there are like elections, identity, asset staking. Um, you can also easily build your very own custom-made palette. And, uh, but one particular palette that I want to talk today about um, is the smart contracts palette, which allows you to write um, smart contracts in ink. So um, I will talk a little bit about the smart contracts palette first, and then I will go over and give an introduction to ink. Okay, um, yeah, so the way that we, that, that we, that we treat um, the, uh, our smart contracts and the pallet contracts is that um, we use ink to, to program smart contracts in Rust. So ink is an embedded domain specific language and we will see soon what precisely this means. And then we compile those smart contracts which are programmed in ink to WebAssembly. We uh, obtain such a Vasm blob. And then we execute this WebAssembly blob in the palette contracts. And so um, what I should mention here, like palette contracts is a WebAssembly runtime for smart contracts. And we can use ink to write smart contracts and compile them to Wasm. But there are also other languages which you can use um, to program smart contracts and then compile them to Wasm. So um, there is Ask, which is um, some assembly script EDSL, which was already built for this purpose. And then actually, indeed, you can also compile solid uh, solidity to WebAssembly there's, exists the Solang compiler which allows you to do this. And I mean, 
if you are like curious about this and and you want to dive dive further, you would even be able to uh, build your own compiler, your own de uh, design your own smart contract language, which you can then compile to WebAssembly. All you have to take care about is that um, finally the compiled WebAssembly code um, calls like uh, the right APIs from pellet contract um, for the smart contract execution. Okay, um, so um, the pellet contracts is a quite um, uh, quite quite useful um, web assembly runtime, and there are a variety of languages that you can use to to write the smart contracts and to execute them in pellet contracts. Um, so then you might ask, like, okay, um, you're building um, in the Polkadot ecosystem. And and you are proficient with Rust, or you want to learn Rust and uh, to do this. And then there is this thing like um, in the end, pellet contracts is just one of many pellets which you can implement in your in your in the substrate based blockchain. And then um, yeah, you could you could ask, um, okay, so finally, what you do with those smart contracts is you implement some business logic, right? Um, so, um, so, so what's the heck? Like, you could also build just your own palette, which serves the same purpose, implements the same business logic as a smart contract. Um, and then the question is, um, if you want to, ha if you have some some business use case which you want to implement uh, on Polkadot, should you implement this as your own palette or as a smart contract? Well. Um, so um, there is this thing that um, a smart contract is definitely like uh, there's way less effort involved to just deploy a smart contract than to obviously deploy your own um, your own substrate based chain like as a parachain on Kusama or Polkadot or also as a standalone chain. So. Um, yeah, smart contract development is just way more approachable than starting right away with your own parachain. Um, so um, yeah, so this is definitely like uh, like one big advantage. You can just start uh, building your own smart contract and you can deploy it on an existing parachain. Currently in production, there is um, Aster and uh, like there are Aster, they have a parachain on Kusama, um, Shiden, where you can already um, deploy ink smart contracts. And very soon, uh, this should also be possible on Polkadot. Um, and um, there are like more chains to come soon, probably. Um, so um, yeah, like um, there's way much less of F. So it's, it's just the easiest way to get started developing, building something, probably with Rust on Polkadot. Um, like um, what you should be aware of if you build smart contracts, this is untrusted code. So this means that um, there is like, um, it's, it's easy to develop, but um, there is there are things involved like gas metering. Um, so which means, yeah, um, like, um, if you have your own um, palette, you, you have a lot more like technical freedom to implement whatever you want and to charge the fees that ever you want to take for it. And if you have a smart contract palette, uh, you don't want anyone to deploy anything which brings down the chain um, by some kind of, of brute force attack, like a uh, very heavy payload. So you have to implement the gas metering, gas metering since it's untrusted code. So you have less technical freedom, but you it's way easier to just just um, develop something there, and then indeed, um, yeah, you can just um, treat those smart contracts as um, first class citizens, and then yeah, like like you you could you can think about um, just building your complete business logic as an ink smart contract. And deploy it on an existing parachain. But then, um, if you want to use 
the pallet contract so that there's going to be runtime as part of your own chain. Um, there are different ways how you can implement pallet contracts in your own um, subset based blockchain. So um, you can treat your smart contracts as first class citizens. So you can just go for some. Um, uh, for some um, smart contract chain, whose ma which main purpose is like deploying smart contracts there. Like there is like Aster, um, which allows you to to just deploy uh, WebAssembly smart contracts, and then you should have some unique selling points. Um, like in the case of Aster, they have like this DApp staking, but they also actually have an EVM uh palette so they they also support solidly smart contracts like like evm solidity smart contracts as well as ink or WebAssembly smart contracts and they also provide some interfaces which was just published recently which allow communications between evm and WebAssembly smart contracts which is quite interesting um you can also um like um Okay, you can also um, treat smart contracts as second class citizens, meaning that you can um, yeah, think about some, some parachain with some palette in which you implement some business logic, like a decentralized exchange, and then you want to add some programmability to your users. Uh, for your users, you want to allow them to to program certain behavior on your blockchain, then you can add pallet contracts as an extra building block, which allows you to them to uh, deploy smart contracts for some specific use cases, like um, they could, um, yeah, um, like uh, trigger some automated trading actions on a decentralized exchange, while the decentralized exchange by itself. Um, yeah, um, uh, is implemented as its own palette business logic. And then um, one last thing that you should be aware of, is probably also a good idea that if you want to later later on build and code your business logic in your own parachain, you can always start with building an ink smart contract. It's, it's already business logic, logic encoded in Rust. You can then take your Rust-based smart contract later on Use all the already implemented business logic and uh, convert it into its own parachain. So definitely, Ink smart contracts is a good way to get started with Rust uh, blockchain development on Polkadot. Um, okay, I did talk quite a bit about uh, pallet contracts, the WebAssembly runtime for Substrate. Um, now I want to focus more on Ink. So Ink is actually, um, it's a Rust-based language to develop smart contract. Um, and what does this mean precisely? Um, well, if you know Rust, you will realize that this is actually totally valid Rust code. Um, this is um, a module, my contract, which does contain a struct which carries one uh, which declares one value, one Boolean variable, and it implements actually some functions to um, like a constructor function, a get and a flip function, which allow to read the struct's value and to mutate it, to flip it from true to false and vice versa. So this is totally valid Rust code. And if you just copy and paste this into uh, your favorite um, IDE and yeah, try to use cargo build to compile it, it will compile and build. And the approach that we took for, um, for Ink Smart Contracts is actually um, that we pro provide some custom macros, like you can think about this as some kind of decorators, which you have to add to your code and which will instruct um, the cargo contract compiler to uh, add certain properties which are required to actually um, call the APIs from the pallet contracts web assembly runtime. So um, what you see here are those decorators which I mentioned. So there is uh, some one macro which like um, 
decorator or macro, which uh, lets our compiler know that this is actually an ink contract at the beginning. And then like there are other macros which are instructing our compiler that at, at certain points we declare actually the storage of the smart contract and for every ink smart contract there's precisely one storage object which is like the state uh, of the storage and then we have a constructor and something specific for ink is that in, actually we can declare more than one constructor here in this case we declare as, as one the new constructor um, and then um, yeah we have two messages and the ink message then just uh, tells the compiler that those are like extrinsic, like callable function of the smart contract, which are exposed through the smart contracts ABI. They can be then later on called by some D app and we will later see how this works and can be done. Okay. Um, there right now, um, like, um, Two ways we can start right away without investing any money to experiment with um, being smart contracts. There is a substrate contracts node. So the smart substrate contracts node um, starts a development chain on your local machine. So it executes some uh, local substrate chain which implements pilot contracts and you can by executing it, um, deploy your smart contracts on your local machine. And then um, another way to experiment with smart contract is the Rococo testnet, where you can deploy uh, being smart contracts. Right now, there's also, since, since a few weeks, there's also like uh, Aster's uh, um, Kusama test, uh, Aster's Kusama net in production available where you can deploy in smart contracts in production. Okay, um, there is a repo which we created recently where you can keep track about projects building with ink and implementing ink and also ink tooling and first examples of ink D apps. Um, so there are quite a few other projects coming up like uh, Fala Network, which is doing some uh, decentralized cloud computation. So they actually are running smart contracts off chain in some trusted execution environments. There are peak, which are like some IoT uh, blockchain solutions for machine communication. There's Aleph Zero, which actually is not a Polkadot or Kusama parachain, but is a standalone chain, which replaces the consensus mechanism. So actually it's, it's a decentralized, is it is it's a DAP, not a blockchain, but uh, they still implement uh, pilot contracts and uh, WebAssembly smart contracts and ink. Okay, and soon probably much more to come. Um, at this point, um, I would like to go over and to um, invite invite everyone to to um, to actually try out ink-based smart contracts and uh, hack with them. So, um, because what I would like to do here is um, I, I provided, I, I created a small GitHub repo, which you can access through tinyurl.com slash ibc minus hack. And I would like to invite everyone to just open it and follow the few basic instructions which are outlined there. This way you will be able to start your own um, blockchain node on your local machine, which allows you to deploy smart contracts. And then I want to edit some smart contracts together with you. Okay. Um, so just tinyurl.com slash IBC minus hack. Um, Should open this uh, GitHub repo for you. And then please be aware that there are two different instructions for either Linux or macOS. 
Um, it's just four command line, uh, like uh, terminal commands which you have to execute to get your own node, local node running, which allows you to actually deploy and interact with your own Rust-based smart contracts. So it's really just, I'm on Linux, so I will follow the four steps from the first instructions. It's, I, I leave it to you to either on Linux or Mac OS, um, execute those four instructions until you have your own local uh, contracts not running. If something goes too fast now, I also invite you to follow those steps later on and to at least try out the very basic um, example of an of an ink smart contract so the first instruction just downloads the contracts node the second one um, unpacks it The third one just CDs into the correct directory. And number four then finally gets your node running. And then um, you will see that it just starts producing blocks. Um, Yeah, if you get this output, your local node runs. Um, and we are good to go and we, can, we are already ready to, uh, to deploy our um, smart contract on our local computer. I just wait another one or two minutes to give everyone the opportunity to open uh, the repo and to type those four commands into their command line. All right, um, then we continue here with instructions. Actually, um, there is a link here to the Ink Playground. Uh, I would recommend to open this in a new tab so that just that you keep your browser tab uh, with, with its repo and its instructions open. And what this actually does, it loads a browser-based IDE, which allows you to edit, compile, test, download, and share your uh, Rust-based smart contracts, your Ink smart contracts. So let's get the screen as large as necessary to be able to, um, to make you see uh, what I do here. 
So um, if we open the ink playground, what we can see is um, actually um, it loads with some standard smart contract, which um, which is like the one which I more or less already showed before in the um, in the introduction. Um, this this is a flipper contract, which is a contract which carries just this one Boolean variable. Um, and um, then it comes comes with those few um, few extrinsics. Like there are actually in this case, I mentioned in the introduction briefly that you can have a constructor overloading. You can define different constructors. And this is something which you cannot do in solidity. And uh, actually you'll see that uh, this smart contract ship here ships with two constructors, a default constructor, and also like an individual constructor. Yeah. And the, the difference is that um, the, the default constructor just initializes, like it uh, instantiates the smart contract with the default value, which is false. And alternatively, you can instantiate your smart contract with either true or false explicitly. So um, this smart contract just carries this one Boolean variable, which can either be true or false, and then ex it exposes this one message, um, this extrinsic, which allows you to flip your state from true to false and vice versa, and also this one extrinsic, which allows you to read the smart contract storage. Okay, what we also have here, what Inc. also provides is built in on a test. So we can here um, define um, some basic test and uh, you'll see like um, in the test section that we actually instantiate a flipper contract and we, since we instantiate it with its default value, the default value should be false. We check that this, this smart contract actually has the state variables value as false. And then there's one slightly more complex test, which allows you to, which, allow, which uh, instantiates the smart contract. And then uh, we check that initially the smart contract carries false. And then after we flip the variable, we indeed get true. So um, yeah, we can open the ink playground and we can go uh, straight ahead and start uh, hacking on the smart contract before we modify anything. We can just see that actually the tests run. Yep. Uh, test results, okay, two pass. Um, and then we can also compile and download the smart contract. Compiling the smart contract takes a few seconds, but not too long. Yep. Okay, that's it. Smart contract is compiled and then we can download it. And um, what we can do next. So uh, at this point, I would to, like to invite every participant to click on compile and then on download. Okay, and I will go now on and I will deploy the smart contract and I want to invite you all to, to do actually the same thing. Um, so what I do is I click on deploy on contract UI. On the top right, there's, there is a button in Ink Playground, which opens actually in a new tab, uh, the contract UI and contract UI is, um, is a front end tool which allows you to interact with smart contracts, which are either deployed on uh, Shiden, Shibuya, uh, on Rokoko, like on the Astro um, Kusama network or like our test networks, or actually 
on your local node. And I would like to invite you to, in the top left on contract to I to select local node. And then uh, if you follow the steps, there's those four command line commands before, and you got your local node running, then this should connect and you should be able to um, actually um, deploy your smart contracts through contracts UI on your local node. Okay. Um, I go on add new contract and upload new contract code. And then there is this section upload contract bundle. Like we have to select an account um, on which we want to uh, for with which we want to deploy um, our um, smart contract. And then if you start the local contracts node, it ships with some like uh, it provides some test accounts which are already there, and we can just leave the first account I list selected. That's totally fine. And then um, I select um, the smart contract that I downloaded before on the in playground and upload it. So I go to upload contract bundle. I select this downloaded smart contract um, as my contract bundle, which I want to upload. And I change the contract name to Flipper because this is a Flipper contract. Um, okay, so we are good to go. I go on next. And here on after clicking next, um, this is the second instantiation page of the smart contract. If you go back to the smart contract, um, I want to remind you that this smart contract actually um, implements two different constructors, one which uh, allows us to declare explicitly the initial variable of our smart contract state, and one is the default constructor. So we have here in our code two different constructors defined. And if you go to contracts UI, uh, we see that we can choose from two different constructors. One constructor is actually the default constructor. And then, oh, uh, You didn't face this problem. Like I, I had probably like two different smart contracts already in my download folder. Um, so I'll just select the smart contract bundle that you downloaded from uh, in Playground and and upload it. And uh, then you have those two uh, deployment constructors. One uh, new co one constructor is called new, and it receives some in initial value, which is a boolean, which is either true or false, and the other one is the default constructor. So um, we can we can select the new constructor, and then we can tell the um, we can tell contracts UI to instantiate this smart contract with the explicit state variable true. And um, we go to next and upload and instantiate. Okay, cool. Um, that's it. Uh, we uploaded and instantiated this smart contract already on our local contracts node. So on our local pellet contracts runtime, which we execute on our local computer. Um, and then you will see like um, it just uh, after instantiation, uh, contracts UI switches to the interact mode. And here in the interact mode, you see um, that the smart contract actually exposes two different extrinsics, two different functions, which you can call. One function is flip, the other function is get. And so this reflects those two messages here, like all the extrinsics or the callable functions of a smart contract, which we want to expose and which we want to interact with in our D app, 
are actually annotated with a with a message macro in the ink message macro. And um, yeah, indeed, there is there are those two functions. There's this is one function which allows us to mutate the smart contract storage. And um, since this is actually mutating the storage, it uh, it obtains like a mutable reference to self. So it's allowed to actually mutate the storage. And there's another function which, which has a non-mutable reference to self, uh, which just reads like it accesses like uh, the struct and it just reads its value and returns it. So um, we did instantiate the smart contract with true. So if we just the 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 um, smart contract state variable should actually be true right now. And we can just call the get function and see the outcome. And indeed, uh, calling get gives true. On the right side here, you see the call results. We can easily execute this a second time. It will still give true. And then next time, we can call flip. And flip will convert uh, the smart contract storage. It, it just um, takes the smart contract storage value, the Boolean, and it inverts it. It switches true to false and false to true and updates the smart contract storage accordingly. So we can just call this. It says call success. And now um, let's call the get a third time. Before we always got true, and now after mutating the storage and actually calling flip, we expect to get false. And yeah, that's true. Okay, that's a very basic way uh, how you can how you can edit, compile, and execute smart contracts. So there are different like ways to go from there. Like um, if you follow the con tutorials, like you should probably at one point like in playground is very good to get started with smart contracts. It's also very good to to share code snippets to discuss them in forums because it has this built in sharing functionality whenever I edit a smart contract I can just create a github gist with one click and I can either share the link to this github gist or I can share the link to the playground which contains the edited code um, so so it's a very useful tool to just hack on something try something out get started with smart contracts uh, obviously for for workshops and also also this to discuss problems and forums but um, if you want to proceed with Ink Smart Contracts, I would recommend you to also install like Cargo Contract and all the machinery and tool chains. It might take you half an hour, and then you are ready uh, to to edit them on your local computer in your favorite IDE like NeoVim, Visual Studio Code, or Emacs or whatever you use, um, and to compile them locally there. Um, okay. Um, Yeah, at this point, um, we did already like uh, compile and build and test our first smart contract. And since there are like 10 minutes left, I have some task. You can maybe I, uh, yeah, you can, you can try and think about it a few minutes for yourself and then, um, I, I will just, uh, go through it and show you how to do it. Uh, so I thought about a basic first um, exercise, which you could try to hack on a smart contract to modify something in a non-trivial way. So just in the case that you um, that you closed um, the repo that I shared before, please uh, reopen it. tinyurlcom slash ibc minus hack. And um, yeah, there is this exercise too. Um, I would just like to invite you like uh, to go open in playground. It will open with the standard flipper smart contract and to modify it in a way. So flipper is like the most basic example of a smart contract as easy as a non-trivial example can get. 
it carries one Boolean variable, which can be true or false, and which can be switched. And I would just like to invite you to change the Boolean variable to an integer like I8. Um, so, and to make the smart contract work in a way that uh, this smart contract then carries a state variable, which is just an integer variable. And then obviously we want not to flip an integer, we want to set an integer. So we change the extrinsic from flip to set. And if you want to set it, we want to set it to a specific value. So it will receive an input argument. And then um, I would like to invite you to, to modify it in a way such that you can have a smart contract where you can actually um, set an integer variable and update it and read it. So that's a very basic exercise. Um, I would like to invite you to try out um, for a few minutes, and then I will do it together with you, um, just to give you an idea about like where in a smart contract uh, like variables are stored and how to access them. And then um, as a first point, maybe try to make the smart contract compile. Um, it will compile even so the tests are malicious or like like are, are not adopted. And then, um, yeah, if you want to continue practicing a bit further, probably or uh, after this workshop, I can, uh, yeah, you're also very welcome to modify the tests or to, to define some new meaningful tests regarding to a smart contract, which keeps an integer variable in storage. So, um, Adelam, we do have a few questions in our comments. Uh, during the workshop, we did see some uh, queries come in the comments. So, if you uh -huh. can take a look in the sure. comment section. Uh, ah, okay, okay. Let me check. Yeah, we did have a few queries coming in, so. Um... Ah, okay. Ah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I'll just... Uh... Well, I mean, that's, that's a great idea. Like, um, I can... Um, I, 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 I take care of the questions, and anyone who's interested in the questions can pay attendance, and everyone else can try to tag on this small exercise and to replace the Boolean with an integer, and uh, then I go back and, and, and do this by myself. Um, Hi Achim, this is Pravin. What are the dependencies that need to be taken care of? So, um, yeah, for developing an ink smart contract, that's a good question. Um, like um, there are the basic like um, like ink dependencies, and I would recommend you um, if you go to Parity Tech GitHub uh, Parity Tech. Uh, ink repo. Uh, ah, okay, actually, um, yeah, actually, for, for ink, ink smart contracts are Rust smart contracts, so basically it's Rust, and um, the dependencies are handled in cargo to Tommel. And there, um, usually you need to declare those dependencies like ink primitives, metadata, ink and storage length, 
and scale and scale info. So um, scale is for converting um, the Rust types into uh, like uh, like serialize them and and make them accessible to our like front end apps and vice versa. And and those ink underscore dependencies are the dependencies which are always uh required when uh when writing in smart contracts so um you usually need to add them to your cargo.com file but actually if you if you um install uh cargo contracts locally the cargo contract compiler and you just type uh cargo contract new flipper or how you ever you want to name your cargo your 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 in smart contract then it will create a new like Smart contract template, which already has a cargo with the required dependencies. Uh, and can we not indicate at one line in the beginning that this is an ink smart contract instead of writing this line so many places? Okay. Um, so the thing is, um, we don't write precisely the same lines so many places. So we actually indeed annotate one time at the beginning that this is an ink smart contract. And you see like this is ink colon colon contract. And then um, we just have a lot of different other um, macros which indicate that this is the storage of the ink smart contract and that this is a constructor and this again a constructor. And then there are two messages and it's just Every time you declare a message which you should want to expose uh, through the ABI to some DF, make it callable, you need to annotate this explicitly because there will also be messages with, which you don't want to expose in more complex smart contract examples like internal messages. Um, yeah, so it's it's not the same line many times. They are different and they, they are required there. Um, Choice between writing a new smart contract using ink and modifying an existing palette, which one should be preferred? Um, yeah, like I, I tried to motivate this a little bit in, in the workshop. Um, this depends a bit on your specific use case. Um, like um, you should be aware, like if you really want to send something to, product, to production, if you want to build your own palette, you need to, in the end, you just need to start your own blockchain, which might be easier on Polkadot than just building a smart standalone chain and you gain a lot of, like, uh, a lot of advantages if you do this, like the shared security through the relay chain, for example, and the interoperability and all this. Still, it's a long path, like you need to probably win, like, a parachain auction to do this. Um, so um, you have a lot more freedom to build precisely, like optimize for your specific use case. If you, if you, if you either modify an existing palette or you you build your own palette, but um, if you if you write a smart contract, um, I mean the smart contract that we opened here together and that we now modify together, no one prevents you from just sending it to production right now. Like you might pay a few cents. For um, for Astas um, Kusama net um, to deploy it there, but the fees won't be high, and then it's there and it's up and running. And then yeah, it's also like um, yeah, palettes will always be more optimized um, and for like more optimal for specific well elaborated business cases. But it's just way easier to start a smart contract. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. No worries. Um, since there is a little bit time left, I would just suggest that I that I just do the exercise that I that I motivated before. So um, we have the smart contract storage, and it's a boolean. And uh, what I will just do is I will modify it to to um, to an integer. And then you will see that um, like the constructor currently, um, it receives an initial value, which is a Boolean. 
we don't necessarily want to have this as a wait. Um, so this is an integer. Um, uh, like the initial value, like since our smart contract now stores an integer, we don't want to instantiate it with a Boolean variable, but with an integer. And um, we don't want to flip anything any longer since our smart contracts now carries an integer variable. Um, we want to set this integer variable. And so we are still mutating storage, but we want to pass the set function um, an argument which is an integer. And then we want to set the smart contract storage to this value that we passed. And then if you want to read the smart contract storage, we don't want to read a Boolean any longer. It should not return a Boolean. It should return an integer. So um, that's already it. This is a small exercise. It's still a few more lines of code to make the test pass, but we are also already ready to um, to actually compile this modified example. To download it. And to deploy the contract CI. Add a new contract. And this time, oops, no, sorry. Uh, upload a new contract bundle, exactly. And there we can add the contract. And I will call this header contract. Okay. Um, we see that indeed now, like our deployment constructor, there's a default constructor, the default value will be zero. Uh, but there is now a constructor which receives an integer value. Um, as initial value, and we can just give it like the value 10. And um, we can instantiate this. And now we have, we see like we don't have any longer a flip function. I modified this accordingly to have like, um, to have a set function which receives, is not no longer like this function now receives an argument. Is an integer variable. So, um, so if you want to, like, we, we can easily call the get function. And since we uh, picked the constructor which instantiates this smart contract with an initial value of 10, we would accept, oh, oh. That's interesting. I obviously did. That's interesting. Ah. Yeah, this should not be out of bounds, but it somehow is. So um, there was a small overflow happening. Actually, I changed the integer from I8 to I32. Now, um, oh.
let's call it setter i32. Initial value 10. And we call the getter. Yeah, now this works as expected. Actually, um, I have to think like why, why it didn't work with i8. Uh, because 10 should not be out of bounds. Um, but I defined an i32 integer variable, which is certainly uh, big enough. And then I can instantiate this with value 10, and I can call get and we get the storage value 10. And I can set this and update this to another value, let's say five. Um, and we can get it again. And actually, it had mutated the storage value to five. Interesting. OK. Um, yeah, this is a, like a basic non-trivial modification, which you can do by yourself um, to modify the very basic clipper smart contract accordingly to get um, yeah to get something which allows you to set a storage value and to read it. OK. Um, Let me also update this because um, I just didn't expect I8 not to work for this. And I, I definitely think after this workshop why this failed. Let me just modify the description to I32. Okay. Okay, um, are there any more questions? Right, so uh, we, we do have a few questions actually. Um, sure, sure. Right, so um, there was a question from, uh, there are a few questions from our community and our viewers today. So uh, it, one of the question is, can you elaborate on how smart contracts on ink overcome the gas fee issue? Um, I mean, uh, you, you have a you have a built-in gas metering the same way as as you have for solid smart contracts. So, um, yeah, you 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 just have to pay gas fees for deploying and and executing smart contracts. Uh, okay. So another question is, but if a choice between writing a new smart contract using ink and modifying an existing palette, which should be preferred? Oh yeah, yeah, but uh, I, I I already said this. Like, uh, um, it depends <laughs> on your use case. Um, if you if you just want to build, get something running, um, the, like this is a very short path to just build something with a smart contract. Like let's say an NFT project, even a DEX, something like Uniswap. Um, like I shared this awesome ink repo earlier, and one of the example projects which are built there, like which are linked there, is like actually um, a decentralized exchange, like more or less a logic which is modeled by Uniswap version two uh, as a smart contract. So this is totally possible to build it as as a smart contract, model it as a smart contract. Um, however. Um, like um, if you have a very like 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 building stuff as a palette means you have like way more freedom to build something very specific to your uh, to your needs and you can take make you can have more freedom to choose like what fees you charge and for what you charge fees um, than with building gas metering. Okay. So another question is, uh, how is a Rust-based ink smart contract better than the Ethereum-based palette? Um, yeah, I mean there are there are different reasons why we think it's 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 Rust more natural because uh, you you write in Rust, <laughs> and uh, Substrate is like a Rust-based world. And as I already motivated, like if you build something and you start with like it's just you can just deploy a smart contract paying a very low fee, so it's a very short path to building your project as a smart contract. And then later on, if you want to convert to your own power chain, you already have your yeah, like your business logic program with Rust. And it's 
way easier to later on convert this to your own chain. Um, and then it's just the thing that we think that WebAssembly is an open standard in the future. Um, there is an ongoing discussion about performance of WebAssembly versus EVM. Uh, and there are some indications that WebAssembly outperforms EVM, at least in the case of Ink Smart contracts, which are like uh, like very optimized in size of of like in terms of binary size of the compiled smart contracts, and there's like also an ongoing process of further optimizing this. Um, yeah, it's it's the thing. It's Rust. Uh, it's more native in the subset world. It's uh, easier to generalize to a chain. Uh, it's an open standard. It's WebAssembly. Okay, so uh, uh, one of the attendees has a question with. Uh, so they know the basics of Python and C++. They have just started in the uh, programming career. So uh, how easy would it be for them to start developing smart contracts? And what is required for the more than that to start off? Um, you mean for someone who knows uh, Python or C++? Right. What would be the ease of them, uh, ease for them to you know start with uh, building smart contracts and uh, whatever we discussed today, like as a beginner? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's um, uh, well, at least if you know C plus plus. I mean, you you need to know some Rust, but um, there are also a lot of advanced concepts of Rust which you don't have to take too much, like which you don't need to know too well to 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 get started with with Ink smart contracts. Um, so it might be a, like like learning Rust is beneficial and it's a very precise language. And we think it's in some aspects also more secure than Solidity. Um, so, so I'd say it, it's worth it. And um, actually, um, if, if someone who is not familiar with Rust wants to start with ink-based smart contracts, I would just probably encourage the person to get Started with some very basic Rust uh, tutorials. They are not uh, like most of the very advanced Rust subjects, like um, like parallel processes, um, um, uh, lifetimes are not needed to just program things, smart contracts. Okay. So uh, we'll take one last question. Uh, yeah. so you did uh, mention community test nets before this. So uh, what is the difference yeah. between Kusama and the community test nets? Like? Um, yeah, actually, um, I guess can, Kusama is what, what we call like a canary test net. And what you mean by this is like, um, it's actually a test net. It's a bit more than a test net. It's something providing some real economic value. So um, like there are like, Every power chain and also uh, also also Polkadot has pure test nets. They have a faucet. You can get like free tokens there um, to experiment with everything to deploy your smart contracts there. See if everything works. Um, but um, we just realized that that a proper test net. Um, uh, which uh, which allows you to 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 test under realistic conditions should also provide some economic value. So Kusama is somewhere in between. Um, Kusama actually has some economic value. It's just the 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 network on which which is more bleeding edge. Every new feature gets deployed there. Um, fees are a little bit lower there and. Um, Especially deploying a parachain on Kusama is way cheaper than deploying it on Polkadot. So it's it's cheaper than Polkadot, but it provides real economic values. It's probably more like the more experimental net, which is more accessible for small projects, has lower fees, but um, is also less battle tested. It's like the battle testing ground for real world projects. Okay, so I think that sums it up. So uh, anything else you would like to add? Since we have concluded, <laughs> um, no, for now it's it's good. Like um, like you, everyone is welcome to reach out to me later on, on uh, yeah, Element or um, Twitter or wherever you find me uh, to to ask more questions regarding to ink smart contract development.
thanks for attend thanks for attendance <laughs> Okay, so this sums it all up and it was indeed a very interesting session. It was very interactive. Uh, we saw um, th there's a lot of valuable takeaways for our attendees today. Uh, thank you all for joining this yeah. workshop. Uh, thank, you, yeah. uh, thank you for the, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining this workshop. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Akim. Thank you uh, to the Parity team. This would not have been possible without. So, and yeah. IBC Media, of course. So before signing off, just a quick word for IBC Media. It's a, a biggest blockchain e ecosystem initiative from India. Uh, we have Polka Dot as our uh, headline sponsor. So we do have a major, major events coming up in the uh, coming days and with a big agenda. So we have hackathons, we have startup pitch competitions, we have DeFi competitions, and we have government-led conferences. And we have lined up four hackathons leading up to the main conference, uh, which is in January. Uh, registrations for Hack1 are going so strong and we have been receiving a good response for it. Um, so I would, uh, I, I would, uh, it would, it would be great if you can uh, hop on and register for the uh, hackathons for us and we promise an exciting environment and top line mentors and the judging panel. I will be sharing the link for the hackathon sign up in the chat box below. And uh, do keep following us on our social media at IBC, uh, IBC Media and our website, ibc.media for regular updates. Um, so that's all from my side. Thank you.